Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. My name is Michael Ogu and I am your host at the Conclave. I'm excited to have us today because we will be discussing a very important subject. Um, we have colleagues on this call from several parts of the world and I'm looking forward to a very robust session today. With me on the conclave today is a special guest, a friend, a sister, um, Fibiana Musa. She is a career coach, a HR expert, and of course, a future of work and talent management leader. We will be discussing talent management as a source of competitive advantage in the new normal. We'll be looking at what talents need to do to ensure that they remain assets to their businesses, but much more importantly, Fibian and I will also be discussing insights on what organizations need to do to do what we call the AROE acronym, attract, retain, and engage talents. Fibian, good morning and welcome. Would you like to say hello to our guests on this edition of the Conclave? Hello, everyone. It's so good to be here. Um, I'm sure we are going to have an exciting time today. And if you have any question, please pen it down so as soon as it session is almost over then there will be time for q a so it's so good being here and thank you for joining us yeah and thanks michael yeah thank you so much fibian that that was great um so our friends and colleagues on the call um fibian and i will discuss the topic for the first 40 minutes and then for the remaining 20 minutes we will invite you guys to ask her your questions or ask me your questions or if there are any contributions on today's edition. We also have a lot of goodies and surprises to also share with us today. So let's get right into it. And um, Fibian, can you just give us a 60 seconds of our view of what today's topic is all about, really? Okay, so um, today we'll be talking about competitive advantage. We'll also be talking about what organizations need to do to leverage on their competitive advantage. Before we get to that, we'll be talking about what competitive advantage is. What exactly do we understand by competitive advantage? And we'll be taking it a step further, saying that, no, it's not just about the organization. As an individual, do you even have a competitive advantage? And if you do, how do you maximize it? So we'll be looking at a whole lot of things around talent management, around what um, ARE, like um, attract, retain, and engage, what you need to do as a nature professional, as a recruiter, as a manager, as a business owner, as the head in an organization, what do you need to do to attract, to retain, and to engage your, your team and your employees? So that's just uh, what we'll be doing in a nutshell. Yeah, Fibian, thank you so much for that summary. And I'm curious to know, which brings me to my first question. Um, you run a business, and I know that you are thinking in the mind of a CEO. And people are already saying we're in the new normal, and you've been a future of work leader for a couple of years. And I'm curious, Fibian, what is it that makes talent management a front burner issue for CEOs in the new normal going forward? Okay, one of the things we need to um, look at is organizations and companies are looking for ways to, to be better than competition. They are looking for ways to deliver values. And what best way to do that than to have highly skilled workforce? Not just highly skilled, qualified workforce to be able to deliver on whatever agenda the company or the organization has. So you cannot run it alone as a business owner, as, as the CEO, is, is beyond you. It is beyond an individual. So you need people to deliver on your strategic imperative or on your growth agenda. You need people. So that's why it's so important to leverage on people to be able to deliver value. You cannot do it alone. Yes, we have technology, but we need people to even run this technology. So you need people. So that's why it's so important right now that organizations leverage on the strength of their employees to deliver value. Thank you so much, Fibian. And I'm curious to know, you mentioned the word strategic imperatives. 
Um, so my next question to you will be, is competitive advantage a strategic imperative for businesses going forward? Hmm. Michael, it is, it is a strategic imperative. You can be in business and you're not thinking of the next thing. You don't even know what your competitors are doing. You don't know what your customers want. I want to remind you that customers' uh, demand it's changing because customers are getting more sophisticated. They have access to information. They have access, they can compare prices. They can compare products at the tip of their finger. They have access to whatever information they need. So how do you differentiate yourself as an organization? How do you leave, you know, just being a local champion? How do you become the best in your industry? How do you even lead that industry so that competition will not, will not make you fade away? So competitive advantage is something that every smart organization should be thinking about. How do we deliver value? How do we become better? How do we position ourselves as the first choice for our customers or our clients? So competitive advantage is something every right thinking business owner, CEOs should be thinking about. Mm. Mm. Deep thoughts that you have shared with us. Um, so my next, my next question to you will be, let's start from the angle of the individual talent before we move to the organization as a bigger landscape. So the question is, what can individuals, and when we refer to individuals, we're talking about people who work in businesses, what can individuals do to position themselves as talents who can help the organizations achieve competitive advantage in the new normal and going forward? Okay, I think, Michael, we should start with the actual definition of what competitive advantage is. Okay, so please that go ahead. We understand, so that we understand what it means to, you know, to have a competitive advantage. You know, when you understand that concept, then you'll be able to see how you can play in that, in that space. Okay, so okay. competitive advantage for business. I'll start with business and I'll now move on to individual. For a business, competitive advantage is... The advantage the business has over its competitors. Mm. And something that you have gained, maybe by offering your customers a greater value or by giving quality product or service. So what advantage does the business have? How do you even say that? I'm playing in this part, but I'm different. What is your, what is your advantage? And it could, be, it could be based on location, it could be based on maybe you have highly skilled labor. You know, I mentioned earlier about you not roll, you can't do it all alone. You need people. So, what is the capacity of the people that you have? What are their composition? What you know, you, you need to look at that from a broader perspective. Then, do you have exclusive distribution rights? There are some advantages that business has that will make them to be positioned as the as the supplier or the provider of choice for their competitive sorry for their customers or for their clients so that is what competitive advantage is all about what you have over your competition or your competition that's okay i know we are still moving to what um, businesses can do but i just want to tell you that competitive advantage can be in two ways for companies for organization it could be comparative advantage and differential advantage what do i mean mm. when you talk about competitive advantage it's not just about I can deliver value or I can, I, I'm, I'm well placed. There are two types to it and there are two ways that organizations can leverage on it. The, one, the first one that I mentioned is comparative advantage. What does this mean? As a company or as an organization, you are in the, the same industry with other players and you are offering the same value, the same products, the same quality. And because you want to have a comparative advantage, you are giving your, your product or your service at a lower price to your, to your customers compared to your competitors. So that is comparative advantage. You are providing the same value, but you are offering it at a lower price because you have maybe probably an economy of scale or because you have highly skilled labor or you have access to cheaper raw material. So you could afford to bring down your price. So that is comparative advantage. We are playing in the same industry, but I can charge lesser. Mm. Because I have an advantage at some point. Maybe proximity to where raw materials are being made. 
I have, uh, you know, I'm closely. So that logistics cost is not there for me. Do you, do, Michael, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I, I, I'm following you. So that's comparative advantage for a company. Now we're not talking about differential advantage. For differential advantage, it's about I'm, I'm, I'm offering a superior product. We are in the same industry, but we are not mates. <laughs> mm. It's just like talking about Apple. Yeah. We are in the same industry, but I have access to maybe a better technology, or I have, I have built my relationship with my suppliers over the years, so I can negotiate on raw materials or whatever I need, or I have access to cheaper labor, or I have a strong brand identity, then I, I have that differential advantage. advantage. Hmm. Because I am different. I am well positioned. I can offer value beyond value. I can give you quality. I'm not playing in the commodity, in the commodity space. I'm a premium brand. So that is a differential advantage for companies. No, no, let's not pick it to an individual. For an individual, it's about what makes you different. Yesterday, I was at a webinar organized by University of Stellenbosch in South Africa. And um, the topic was, what can Africa contribute to the fourth industrial revolution? And the speaker, that's Professor Martin Butler, he said something. He said, competitive advantage is something you are greater at than somebody else. So if there's nothing that you are greater at than somebody, then you don't have a competitive advantage. For, for an individual, how do you now position yourself for that comp to leverage on your competitive advantage in this new normal. The first thing you need to do is to be able to identify that your unique selling point, what sets you apart from others. If you cannot, you know, identify what sets you apart, then you can't, you can't leverage on your competitive advantage. So individual, how can you position yourself for this competitive advantage in this new normal? I will give you five strategies to, that you can do. It's, there's something called, you know, I mentioned differentiation um, strategy the other time. So for an individual too, you're looking at your unique selling point or your unique selling proposition that we use, what we know as USP. How are you unique? Do you know how to do presentation better? Do you know how to, maybe yours is public speaking. Maybe yours is even relationship building. Maybe yours is even negotiation or persuasion, you have a unique skill. So how are you not differentiating yourself with that unique skill? Mind you, your competition as an individual could be, depending on your position, it could be other applicants. Maybe you're buying for, you're applying for a role. So other applicants are your competition in that aspect. Then it could be your, the, maybe your colleagues at work or your peers. Then technology is also your competition because if your work can be done by just a click of a button the technology is your competition so how do you not want to in this new normal how do you not want to be different how do you want to be known for something i said five strategies differentiation strategy your operational effectiveness strategy that driven competitive strategy innovative strategy and association strategy let me tell let me talk about it briefly because of the time differentiation strategies your unique selling point. What is unique about you? I mentioned it earlier. Maybe you're good at data analysis. Maybe you're good at, maybe an aspect of human resources you're good at it. Or an aspect of maybe branding you're good at it. So whatever you are good at, own it. Own that uniqueness that you have. That is your unique selling point. That is what you are better at than somebody else. Then operational effectiveness. How can you differentiate yourself with that? How are you completing your task and delivering this? Everybody is given the same. Maybe you and your team, you all have the same JD, for instance. So how do you now deliver on yours for you to be different? You are meant to work on a project. Are you just, are you just um, submitting because for doing sake? Or you are going extra mile to deliver? Maybe mm. the way you are presenting the project could be different. Maybe you are bringing in charts, you are bringing in figures, you are bringing in pictures, you are comparing with competitors, and you are making that known in your deliverable, and you are presenting that. Maybe you have a presentation to make, and you are using that to make presentation. 
that is operational effectiveness. The way you deliver, there's a thought of excellence to what you're doing. You are not just like every other person. So oh. you can leverage on that operational effectiveness, delivering effectively on projects, going above and beyond the call of duty. Then number three, the tech-driven competitive advantage. I mentioned it earlier. I said um, technology is your competition. Although we are looking at cobots now, collaborative um, robots that can work alongside with humans. But we should know that technology is our competition. So what are you doing about that? Are you embracing technology? Is there a relevant app that, is, that you're using to complete your work? Do you even know how to use them? Can you navigate your way through? Are you learning modern technology? Are you even tech um, savvy? Are you upskilling? So that is tech-driven competitive strategy that you need to have as an individual to position yourself for competitive advantage in this new normal. Then we are looking at innovative competitive strategy. Because something is being done this way, does not mean you should continue to do it that way. You need to be able to question status quo. You need to be looking for creative ways of completing that task at work. You need to ditch mundane processes and look for modern way of completing. It's, it's just like somebody is giving you something to type and somebody is using typewriter while another person is using a computer system. I'm just using that as an analogy. So what better way can you deliver? Can you be innovative in whatever you're doing? That is how you can set yourself apart from the other person. If we are all doing the same thing, then there is no uniqueness. Then the last one, association competitive strategy. Who are the people in your circle? Oh, How can people, you leverage in your, the circle? in your circle? Wow. How can you leverage on their expertise to deliver on projects, to deliver on yourself, to deliver on your career path? How are you expanding your network? What group do you belong to? What association do you belong to? Or you are just in, in a silo? You can't work in a silo. Who are the people? What relationship are you building? Are you building international relationship? Is it local in, in, um, relationship? Is it global? What kind of relationship are you building? So these are the things that can set you apart in this new normal. Oh. These are the advantages that you have that you need to leverage on and not just be a commodity. Don't wow. Be a brand. Don't be a commodity. Be different. Wow, Fibian. That's awesome. Your last statement is striking. Don't just be a commodity. Be a unique brand. Uh, and, and I heard a number of things you mentioned. You had talked about the concept of skilling. I know in some of our earlier conversations, you, you've been propagating the gospel of cure, <laughs> cross-skilling, upskilling, skilling, you know, and reskilling and expert skilling. I know I'll have to bring you up at some <laughs> other time to talk about that. And guys, watch out for you know, future editions where Fibian will be talking um, critical issues. For those of us who are just joining us, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from the world. Um, we are discussing talent management as a source of competitive advantage. And I have my host, um, Fibian Amusa, a career coach, future work leader, and talent management expert. Fibian, thank you so much for those insights around competitive advantage and strategies to position ourselves for competitive advantage. I'm curious to know, Fibian, and my next question before we throw the floor open to our colleagues on the call is, what can organizations start doing differently? And uh, please take note of the emphasis on differently. It's not as if they've not been doing, but what can they start doing differently in the area of AROE, which is attraction, retention, and engagement of talents in the new normal? Okay, um, thank you, Michael. So what can organizations start doing different? I know they've been doing it, but what, what differentiation strategy should you bring into this? You need to start from your strategic manpower planning, workforce planning. That is the first thing. Before you even engage a talent, before you even think about recruitment, the first thing is how many people do we need? What is even the business objective? You can't just wake up one day and say, okay, I need two people tomorrow. Who does that? And if that's what you've been doing, then it needs to change. You need to look at the overall business strategy. Okay, we want to expand to the northern side of the country by the year 2022. Then we need to start, we need, you 
should have started planning like three years ago. You need to start planning. In two years that we, so when we are moving to the northern side of the country, or we are expanding to another country in, in, in West Africa, or wherever we are moving to, we need to now plan. Your map, planning should be the first thing. What kind of skill do we need in the people we are looking for? Do we need somebody that is IT um, savvy? Do we need somebody that, that is good in marketing, sales and marketing? You need to now be able to identify specific skills that you need in the people. So the first thing you need to do is to plan. You, you just have to plan. And your planning has to be in tune with the overall corporate objective to meet present and future business needs. Then your talent attraction and retention has to be top notch. You need to look for cost effective way. You know we are saying that you want to maximize the value of your talent for competitive advantage. So it should be at a very a cost effective way. What kind of uh, sourcing strategy are we looking at? I'm going to turn to the six Bs. Are we looking at building? Do we want to train our people? Are we looking in-house? If we are looking in-house, what skill are we looking at? Then do we need to train? Maybe we are moving our business, we are opening another branch. Do we need to train somebody now to move out, to one head that branch while we get a new team? Or we need to bring somebody else, somebody new entirely that understands the markets. So you need to look at your sourcing strategy. Then, are we borrowing? Do we need to outsource? Sometimes outsourcing is a business, is a business um, strategy. Do we need to outsource? We don't have the competence, but we have somebody that has the competence. Should we outsource another company? Are we buying? So when you are bringing in talent, you need to think it through. What kind of talent? Then how do, we, do I source for this talent? Then, Performance management is also something you need to look out to maximize your talent pool. Your job skill, the people that aren't being a particular role, do they, is it, is it, are, they, are they good fit for that role? Are they good fit? Then how are you assessing them? There are new trends in performance management right now. And we have individualized performance management system, meaning okay. that you can't judge everybody. It's not a one size fit all. <laughs> Performance management strategy is not a one size fit all because you are judging everybody. You know, we are so used to this appraisal system that everybody must tick a box. Somebody in marketing is ticking the same thing as somebody in operations, somebody in finance, somebody in IT. <laughs> it can't be it, it, it. going forward. And the new trend in performance management is beyond that. Are you judging a fish by how high it can fly? So we need to bring it to, uh, into perspective. How are you managing your talent? Then your learning and development. You just have to train your people. The skills of yesterday are not enough to do the jobs of tomorrow. You just have to train your people. If you want to maximize the value of your talent, don't feel that they are all well trained. We have new technology coming up every day. Your competitors are not sleeping. So what are, what, what are they doing? If you think you don't want to train your people, then they leave you. you giving them access to the right information. Then your reward and recognition also. Is it fair? Is it competitive? In learning and development, because somebody is working with you, does not mean they don't have a future aspiration. Does not, does not mean that no other life exists. You need to think it through. The total employee experience. Mm. I think that will come in when we are talking about engagement. Yeah. Your total employee experience. experience. What is the life? Then your succession planning to come into play. Are you? Are you? Are you, are you avoiding a key man risk? It's just okay. one person that can do all the job. You are, you are working on a ticking time bomb. Not only a key man risk, Fibian. Someone who is doing the job is both a key man and a flight risk, you know. <laughs> one risk because the person can take off at any point in time. Even if the person is, you know, key to the business. And some people, 
are so used to that that they will tell you that I'm not coming to them, I'm not feeling too well. And everybody will start running Delta Skelter because you have a key marriage and a top flight list. So we need to rethink our, think it through, our, ma our employee management system, we need to think it through. The way you attract, the way you retain your people, performance management, uh, career development um, strategies, your, your learning and development, your reward and recognition, how are you rewarding your people? Everything is not just about cash, cash, cash. Are there some other variables you're putting, you, you're bringing in? Are you giving them specialized, maybe a paternity leave, maybe a all paid, um, all paid uh, expense trip to, or all expense paid trip to, to anywhere in the world? Is it, you know, you need to think it through. You need to think it through. Hmm. Thank you so much, Fibian. Um, their colleagues, we will be open the floor up now for question and answers. Please type your questions in the chat box. Um, Lidi, Micah, you raised your hand up at some point in time. Do you want to ask a question? If you do, please, you have the floor. Sorry, Michael, before we open the floor, there's one thing okay. I just want to quickly mention before we... Okay, before, um, please go ahead, Fibian. And that is about your engagement. We are talking about how you retain your people. How engaged are your people? There's one thing that is crucial. <laughs> employee engagement starts from onboarding. Mm. If you cannot engage somebody during the onboarding stage, you have lost that person. The person can be working for you, but you have lost the person. Maybe on the first day, is the one asking for the computer system to use, he's asking for access. He has to go and sit down at the IT office to get access by himself. He has to, maybe the first week, he has to sit at the reception to complete work because his workspace is not ready. Maybe he has to, you know, if we don't get it right at the onboarding stage, you have lost that talent. You have lost the talent. That is where your, your employee value proposition, what are you offering your, 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 your team, your employee, in terms of compensation, in terms of benefits, what are you doing? Then the overall candidate experience, how are you managing it? How are you managing it? So hey, a whole lot of things go into this um, employee engagement and retaining people because you have to be able to, en to engage your people before you can retain them. Somebody that is not engaged, you can't retain the person. Mm. The working environment, are they sitting on a, on a rickety chair? Are they coming to the office at their own risk? You know, when you park somewhere, <laughs> it will be cars parked at owner's risk. And you know, are, you, are, are they coming at their own risk? So think about, think it through. Do they have access to the necessary tools? They even need to deliver on the job or they are using their own personal laptop. Or they're not even, they don't even have a say. It is not inclusive management style. So we need to think it through. We need to really think it through. Thank you so much, Fibian. I, I can't just help but smile. You know why? Um, so when I teach talent management, when I run open workshops, onboarding and the candidate experience is a full day workshop yeah, it because, is. because that subject alone, you know, the last time I did an onboarding masterclass was in March. Um, some of the people who attended on the call, Tulu Ajay is on the call. I spent eight hours demystifying onboarding. And let you know that onboarding is an engagement, it's a talent engagement strategy. And I share practical insights on how you can improve the candidate experience, even yeah. from the way the person who sits in the talent acquisition role. How do you chat with a, 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 with a candidate? Most often times we miss on on key talents, not because they are not interested. Some of those key talents are passive candidates. But how do we sell our organizations to them in such a way that they become interested? Um, Ijoma Nkwonta is also on the call. She's a very close friend of mine. Um, a couple of years ago, Ijoma was trying to sell a role to me. She was working for Global Profilers. I was a passive candidate then, but the way she sold that role made me interested. I didn't want to move, but I started thinking of moving. <laughs> So do, do people who sit in talent management roles have emotional intelligence? Do they have negotiation skills? Do they have those soft skills that set them apart? And I'm excited, you know, 
with what you had shared with us, the different strategies that set, you know, talents apart in the new normal. So colleagues, it's time for us to ask our questions. The floor is open. We'll take questions or comments or contributions. Lidi, Micah, do you have a question? Okay. Yes, I'm here. Okay, you Good. raised your hand at some point in time. Yes. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll prefer to go up, um, just to speak and rather than be on the video. But let me, I want to add to what our speaker was saying, and I'm very, very impressed at, uh, at the level at which she is able to navigate the, the process. Now, let, on the process of onboarding and talent management, I, would, I, I just take a clue from what happened in my organization, one of the organizations I happened to speak to. And they were owing salary for about three months. And we brought in a very competent person as an operation manager from Saipan. And when the guy came in, we tried to put the office together. But one thing I remember is that if we are going to pay salary for one month out of the three months, we need to pay the guy the August salary while he just resuming. I think that is a way to motivate him. And when he got the salary, I tell you, he was happy. He felt that the organization remember him and, and he was moving on beyond the speed that he, he, we were actually looking at. And we discovered that that onboarding process, that understanding, that way of taking him along has actually bring in a whole lot of deliverables to be achieved within a short period. And I think I totally agree with her on business advantage and individual advantage. Because if you have a business advantage and then you do not have an individual advantage, you cannot meet up with the business objective of that organization. So I totally agree with her. So I'm very happy to hear from her on this perspective. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Michael, for those contributions. Colleagues, um, if you have a question or you have a contribution, the floor is open. While we wait for that, um, Fibian, just um, please provide additional perspective. So I was reading in the Harvard Business Review yesterday um, while we were preparing and while I was asking you any additional thoughts and all of that. Okay. And so in that Harvard Business Review, I'm going to quote verbatim. It says, talents are individuals who have developed a high depth of excellence, experience, and expertise. Fibian, what are your thoughts on that statement, number one? Does that apply to the new normal going forward? Okay, can you repeat the statement again? I'm trying to... Talents are individuals who have a depth of excellence, experience, and expertise. They are individuals who have a depth of excellence, experience and expertise. I'd like you to share your thoughts on that statement, number one. Number two, is that statement relevant in the new normal going forward? Okay, thank you, Michael. Yes, it is very relevant in the, um, in the new normal. The depth of experience, when you're talking about depth, you're talking about somebody having a, maybe a cross-skilling. Cross-skilling is uh, broad, that is the breadth. Then upskilling is the depth. The depth meaning that you understand the totality of what you're doing. So talent is somebody that has a depth of experience and expertise, meaning that they are not just they they are not just um, working with a maybe a shallow knowledge of what they are doing. In depth experience, so and that in depth in depth experience makes them like give them the competitive advantage, and that's why they can negotiate higher value during salary negotiation. Because, I, you know, when you're talking to candidates, I ask him, what value are you bringing to the table? And the person is able to tell you, my, this is my, these are my 30, 60, 90 day plan. This is what I plan to do. And you could say value because the person is talking from in-depth experience. So for you to have a competitive advantage in this new normal, your experience has to be deep. It has to be deep. What we, how will you differentiate yourself from the next person? You know, I told you that your, your competition, if you're vying for a job, your competition is the next applicant. So how, how are you different? If we are all talking the same, the same way, we are offering the same value, then there is no differentiated competitive advantage unless there is a depth to what you're doing. 
and that will not come overnight. You work at it. Are you giving yourself to a lifelong learning experience or learning strategy? Are you committed to that? So that will not happen on you. That, oh, it just happened on me. <laughs> you have to work at it. You have to be deliberate. You have to be intentional in gaining depth. To be a special talent, you need to have depth. And that depth has to do with you working at it and working towards it. Are you upskilling? Do you even know what's going on in the industry? Are you cross healing? Cross healing means you have, you have done like of what happens around you. The other person, maybe your, your, your output is another department in peace. Do you know what that department is doing? The value chains of what you're doing. Do you have an idea of what is going on? That's why some organizations will use backward integration as a competitive advantage for themselves because they can go back and do what their supplier is doing. While some people will look towards forward integration, the distribution channels as their competitive advantage. So as an individual, you need to have depth, and that takes a lot of work to do. You need to be intentional about it. You cannot survive in this new normal. I was talking to Michael at that time, and we were talking about how skilling is a workplace survival strategy. I think I'm letting the card out of the bag. <laughs> okay, so so you need you need you need to be you need to be highly skilled. You need to have depth, depth, depth. And let me say, the, the, the Bible even says that depth call it unto depth. So if you want to operate in, uh, in, in, in a particular level, then uh, you need depth. People will look at it and say, hmm, yeah, deep. That means that you have depth. <laughs> thank, thank you, you my so girl. Much, <laughs> All right. So um, we've not seen any additional questions, but I'd like to call some of my friends and, you know, colleagues to share a couple of perspectives on okay, sorry. the topic. Sorry for cutting yeah. you short, uh, Michael. Yeah. You mentioned something about candidates, and um, I wanted to mention it, but you know, a lot of things. That, uh, do you know something called keeping your candidates warm? There's a, there, there is a concept called keeping the candidates warm, which recruiters or hiring managers use, and that speaks to what you were saying, that people, the employee experience is your how people interact with every touch point of the organization starting from when they are applying do they do interview and they are left handing is there a feedback or you're, you're talking to them on the phone inviting them for an interview and you're being rude because you feel it's the employer's market and you can talk to people because they are the one at after all they are the one looking for the job so you're, you need to keep the candidates warm. Even if the candidate eventually, the person is not coming on board, you can have a pool. Like maybe you have people in keeping view. How are you keeping them warm? Do you have a talent pool? People on your talent pool, they are, not yet, yet, they are not working for you yet. How are you keeping them warm? Do you send them communication? Do you communicate with them? Did you even, you know, so it, 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 it's, it's all encompassing. It is all encompassing. And yes, it is. it is, um, Fibian. So I'd like to take contributions from friends and colleagues, and I'm going to be calling people in no particular order. Ibinabo is see here. Ibinabo, thank you for joining in. Um, can you share your perspectives on the topic? Um, we'd like to hear you a minute or two. I don't know if she heard me. Okay, Kola Wale Nasiru. Kola Wale is my good friend. Kola, any thoughts on the topic we are discussing, Kola? Hmm. Okay, Ijoma, IJ. IJ, if you can hear me. Um, can you share your perspectives on the topic? So I just appreciated all she talked about. The particular one that entered very well was the part of when she said, you know, you can have a job and um, technology will be your competition. I appreciated that particular point. And 
why I appreciate it is because it's now the, the COVID-19 has stripped like a lot of people out of their jobs and it's now becoming more glaring when we've been saying technology can strip you of your job if you are not careful and the need to keep up skilling. So I, I just appreciate that particular part of the um, technology perspective being our competition and the need to upskill and also cross skill. Thank you. Thank you so much, IJ. Samuel, I can see your hand. Um, can you go ahead and ask your question, Samuel Ogunlade? Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, Coach Fibian. Thank you very much, Mr. Michael. So I have, I think, about two questions now. The first one is, you made mention of the fact that you must appreciate the fact that everyone has, um, everyone has the talents or their ability which they are able to bring um, onto the job in an organization. So what's your take on organizations placing a particular minimum experience, uh, maybe work experience on candidates, forgetting the fact that even a, a new graduate might be able to you know, deliver something based on Perhaps he has done some form of personal development, gained some skills, but in which companies or uh, industries now plays a particular work experience, you know, above that individual um, skills that the candidate has? I don't know if you understand my question. Yes, we do. And what's the second question? Okay, the second question is this. In a situation whereby you are in an organization in which those sitting at the ends of affair, perhaps, they belong to, um, you know, the generation we are not used to this technology and uh, to this new normal. So how do you convince them, especially if they are form of Luddites, you know, people who don't really want to change. So how do you convince them to, you know, bring in this, to chip in this, especially when they, when, when they, they believe that this technology is a threat to their own work or to their own job. So how do you convince them uh, to bring in this to the um, to board? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Samuel. Fibian, over to you. Okay, um, Samuel, thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, for organizations that, that have a particular experience, they're asking for particular experience. When it comes to, we can't, uh, we can't really fault that anyway, in terms of experience, when it comes to experience, we can't fault it. Because you have a particular job, and even during your job design, when you're designing that job or you're designing that role, you have at the back of your mind the kind of the level. You know, I was talking about uh, manpower planning at the other side. The level at which you want the job holder to be, like the expertise you want the job holder to have, or the kind of experience. I'm telling you that, yes, you can have a fresh graduate that has expertise, but you might not have the depth of the experience on that job. Let's be factual. Because sometimes it's not just about the academic experience. I know people can argue this. It comes with practicality. You handling this. For instance, you're bringing somebody into the CEO role or the CEO role, and you're looking at a fresh graduate. I'm not saying it doesn't have the capacity. I'm saying that you may want to have somebody that has experience. And when somebody is coming into that kind of leadership role, we are getting it wrong. It is not about the academic profile. It is about the relationship he has built over the years. Because when you are recruiting senior level, you are not looking at, he has to run, he has, you might look at other degree anyway, maybe mm, MBA or that. But what is important is the relationship you are bringing into that role for executives. Do you have strategic alliance with the industry, maybe industry regulators, maybe come, maybe you have even worked for competition at some point, and we need that knowledge, that exposure. So recruiting into a role is much more than academic profile. It's beyond that. So I want us to look at it that way. Then another thing that I will fault when it comes to recruitment is when we have bias, when you're talking about age. When you, you, you are looking at it that there's no diversity and inclusion, you're talking about age, you're talking about uh, gender, you're talking about ethnicity, you're talking about religion, um, you're, you're talking about a whole lot of things aside the person's competencies. Then how we fault that? Because the new trend in recruitment right now says that you should remove all bias. There is diversity and inclusion now. 
and now we have equal employment opportunity that is a concept that every organization should hold on to everybody has equal chance but when it now comes to bringing somebody with experience let's look beyond the academic and look at what other value this person is bringing into the role i hope i've answered that oh yes you have yes you have okay so the second question you're saying that when you have people in the maybe the board there was i read an article sometimes that there are robots in the boardroom so when you have people in the boardroom that you know they're not so open to technology let me tell you something you don't need much convincing now covid made it glaring to everyone be it baby boomers be it um be it millennial be it centennial be it generation x whatever generation covid made it glaring to everyone right now that we need to leverage technology so you don't even need to do much convincing before people know that we need technology and how you cannot convince to buy into your idea is another is another topic entirely and we are looking at we are looking at negotiation your negotiate negotiating skill or your persuasion skill and one of the things you do when it comes to out of negotiation you consider the ethos, the pathos, and the logos. I know this is not um, a, a negotiation class. So you need to look at the person who wants to sell your idea to. Is this person a logos? Logos means is this person logical? Does it like seeing facts and figures? If that is who the person is, then you come with facts and figures. If we adopt this technology right now, in the next two years, this is what we would have achieved. And you know, you, you, you come with figures because it is a logos person, it's a logical person. Then when you now look at, you're looking at somebody that is, that is um, there is pathos, there is logos, and there is, um, there is ethos. And when you're now looking at somebody that is ethos, you are looking at, you want to bring past, or you want to look at historical trend. That's pathos, you want to look at historical trend. Our competitors did this and they achieved this. Or somebody else in another industry did this and they achieved this. You are coming with history, you are coming with trend. Then you can use that to sell it to the person. Then when you now look at it, those emotion, you want to appeal to that emotion. If we don't do this, we may be out of, we may have to close shop and some other people may lose their job. And people will be looking for a job. You know, you're coming with empathy. You are talking to the emotion. So the first thing for you to do when you want to convince somebody is to understand that person. Is it a logos person? Is it a pathos? And is it a ethos? Is it an ethos person? You need to look at that. I think that is it. <laughs> Michael, I hope I, I want to just yes, stop. Yes, thank you so much, Fibian. Um, great insights that you have shared, and we are going to bring you on board. Um, at a later date for um, much more deeper insights around um, skilling and let people know that hmm, talents need to, you know, skill up as we get ready for the future of work. I have one of our guests all the way from, you know, another part of the world. I would love him to just give some closing remarks before we close the meeting. Honor 6X. Um, can you please unmute your mic and um, possibly turn on your video if you don't mind and if you could just give us some closing remarks. He's joining us from another time zone. I don't know if he heard me anyway. Okay, while I wait for him, I just want to quickly share um, some of the upcoming events at the Conclave with us. I don't know if we can see my screen for those of us who are joined. Um, in the month of October, we are having a special conference on the Conclave. It's called the Personal Growth and Transformation Conference 1.0. And the theme is Unfolding Your Best You. This is the first flyer. Other flyers will be coming out. And basically what we'll just be discussing at this conference is 
how can you emerge as a new individual such that you can begin to you know do things differently and so what the conference is all about is how can you reposition how can you reemerge how can you deal with limiting beliefs self defeating beliefs that are holding you back from emerging you know when a butterfly wants to emerge it emerges beautifully so that's what the conference is all about um, we have a fast action deal of 9000 before september 15th the early bird deal is between september 16th to um, 30th and then late registration is 15000 i will drop the flyers in the chat box we will also be starting a new series in the conclave in the month of October. It's titled the series P-I-L-L. -L. That is, um, P-I-L-L -L is, it stands for purpose, identity, leadership, and legacy. We'll be starting the Peel series in the month of um, October. So please watch out for the flyers, don't miss them. One of the um, speakers at the Emerge Conference will be sharing with us at, um, at the Peel session. So please watch out for the flyers. Um, it's going to be an awesome time. And most likely, we will also have Fibian join us as well in the month of October. So I don't know if Honor 6X can hear me. For 6x, if you can hear me, we'd just love you to give um, closing remarks and possibly um, say a couple of things. Honor 6x. Yes, I've unmuted you, so you can go ahead. I don't know. On a six X, can you hear us? Uh, I can't. I His video is on, but. Yeah, I can't. Um, I can't see. I can't hear him. Okay, let me invite someone else to give us a closing remark um, just before we sign out. Um, Tony, Tony, can you give us closing remarks? Oluwa, Tony, Elizabeth, Tony, can you give us closing remarks? Yeah. Thank you so much, Emo. Thank you, Phoebe, for the wholesome. Uh, delivery of the session. We appreciate everyone on the call. Yeah, we can't wait for the October session. So everyone should just look forward to that and sign up academically. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, it's been a great time today. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining the session today. The month of October is loaded. Our next, um, we're starting a series for the month of September. Like I said, it's called Peel, Purpose, Identity, Leadership, and Legacy. Please watch out for it. Um, and then, of course, um, the Personal Growth and Transformation Conference. I've shared the flyer with us. You can do well to register. There is a fast action deal now of 9,000 before September 15th. Why should you attend the Personal Growth and Transformation Conference? Everyone needs to emerge at some point in time. And so if you, if you want a new you to emerge in the new normal, uh, take advantage. We have nine powerful speakers who will be speaking at that conference. The topics, I don't want to let the topics out of the bag yet, but watch out for the individual speakers, flyers, as we will be sharing them and we will share the recordings of the conclave to your registered email addresses so it's not a problem um on this note i'd like to say thank you so much to coach fibian for this session she is a friend and a sister and many thanks to her husband for joining us even though he has not said anything i think i should <laughs> hear one or two things from my husband um <laughs> 
Pastor John Amusa, I don't know if you just like to greet the house and say a couple of things. Thank you so much for supporting your wife. I mean, to be foolhardy if we don't um, hear one or two things from me. I know your wife wouldn't want me to do that, but I'm a man and I understand the place of honor. So please, can you just say a couple of things before we wrap up? Ah, okay. Wow. <laughs> please, wow. Thank, 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 thank you, Michael. Wow, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good, uh, good day, everyone. Uh, just like what you said, everyone, uh, everywhere. Good day, everyone. Uh, wherever you are. Uh, it's, it's good to be here. Uh, learned a lot. Uh, I'm always learning. You know, I have a coach beside me, so I'm always learning. And also, having you also, as in Michael, I've read so much about you and uh, read so much. So I just want to thank everybody. Thanks, as in, for the conflict events and also looking forward for the events ahead. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, dear colleagues. Wherever you are, you are joining us in the world. Thank you for joining in. Please look out. Okay, Honor 6X, I don't know if his, if his audio is working now. Um, he joined us all the way from um, another time zone. I think that's from the UAE time zone. If, yeah, Honor 6X, please, can you just say a couple of things to us? before we close. I think your video and your audio is on now. You have the floor. Thank you very much for uh, this excellent uh, conclave. And uh, I really thank the coach. It was really uh, interesting, uh, knowledge sharing, and uh, also I would say interactive. Uh, I'm very pleased to be a uh, part of this conclave and uh, hope to participate in uh, the conclusion of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You. He joined us all the way from, from the UAE time zone, and it's, it's encouraging to have him with us on the conclave. So, there, colleagues, um, we've shared the flyers for the conference. Please do well to register. It's, it's, it's a conference you should not miss. The caliber of speakers is top notch. We have world-class coaches, leaders, subject matter experts doing justice to the topic. One of the topics at the conference is, it's your time to emerge. And someone was asking me, why, 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 why should people emerge? You know, and I said, see, sometimes you need to evolve and emerge. You know, so a new you needs to emerge. But please watch out for the flyers for the upcoming sessions. September is packed. Someone was asking me, what is the meaning of identity? And I said, you know what? Just come to the conclave. You will hear. Your, your bank account does not identify you. Your titles have nothing to do with your identity. Your degrees have nothing to do with your identity. So come, come and find out what identity is all about. We'll be looking at the Peel series in September, purpose, identity, leadership, and legacy. It's, a, it's, it's going to stretch throughout the month of September. I hope we can finish it. And um, I look forward to seeing us in subsequent editions of the Conclave. From me and all members of the Conclave team, Tolu Ajayi um, and every other person on the team, we'd like to say thank you for joining us. And we'll see you in subsequent editions of the Conclave. Please enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Bye.